Welcome to our live session. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to introduce you to all of our opportunities at our program. Um, and you can like find out more about our program if you have not previously attended our shadowing sessions. And um, just to introduce pre PHS, Free Health Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit. And we are dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic. So um, my name is Muntaha and I am the Editor-in-Chief here at Pre-Health Shadowing. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood, for giving us your time. And let's get started with our startup. So just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for any students who need it. All of our sessions um, have this and it's made to accommodate all students. The, this setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need assistance enabling the transcript, you can uh, direct message one of our um, team members through the direct um, messaging chat in Zoom, and we'll be able to help you and enable your transcript. Um, furthermore, if you had any recommendations to make PHS more accessible to students, you can definitely email us at info at freehealthshadowing.com, and uh, we'll see what we can do to improve our sessions. If you want to stay in the loop and uh, visit uh, our session to get updated on when we have our sessions. You can follow us on Instagram, you can follow our TikToks, and uh, you can definitely sign up for our email list using the links in the chat. Um, this will keep you up to date on when we have our sessions. So since this is an international program and we want to know where everyone is Zooming from, you can definitely drop in the chat and I'm actually calling from Florida. So let's see where everyone else is calling from. If you can drop your uh, region in the chat. Awesome, it's nice to have so many people from around. Now, before we start today's session, I just want to shout out Dr. Lynn Holden, who held a live session with us last week for her generous donation of $300 to Pre-Health Shadowing. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Holden, for your donation, and we sincerely appreciate it. Um, and then let's go to our next slide. We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits of Pre-Health Shadowing. Uh, we have our research uh, program that will allow students to connect with PIs and uh, which are principal investigators as they conduct research in a plethora of topics, fields, and locations. This program is 100% remote, which means you have the power to connect with anyone from around the world. For more information on our research program, please fill out the interest form sent in the chat below, and we will get back to you as soon as possible with additional details and this research program is available to you and it's available to all sorts of students and you will be getting the training that you need. So if you fill out the interest form, we'll keep you um, up to date on the updates on our sessions. So we have partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan study guides and products that can prepare you for standardized tests such as the MCAT, NCLEX or PCAT. If you fill out our short survey in this chat, we will get you signed up for these deals for free. And for the month of July, Pre-Health Shadowing is excited to announce that we are hosting a bingo board social media event where you will be able to fill up a bingo board with each, uh, with each board having a specified dollar amount. To participate, all you need to do is post this on your social media platforms and get a group of friends to help you fill up the board and you can check our blog post out for more details on the bingo board and the donations will be going to our nonprofit organization directly. Additionally, we have partnered up with Krispy Kreme for you to purchase one dozen donuts to enjoy with your loved ones with a donation of $10. You'll be able to receive your treat and also help us at PHS. More information and instructions can be found clicking the link in the chat on how to get your Krispy Kreme donuts. Lastly, it is the perfect time to exercise outdoors. So with Pre-Health Shadowing's new Pledge Drive event. For this event, you will essentially be able to work out and help raise money for an excellent and healthy cause. For every $5 donated to you, you will be required to exercise for one hour and these donations will be going to PHS. So for more information, please visit our website underneath the blog section about our PHS Pledge Drive. And another organization I'd like to introduce you to is Masks for Masks. It's an amazing women-led organization and they donate four masks for every four masks they uh, happen to sell. 
So these masks that are being donated go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as those in the homeless community, those uh, without proper PPE working in the healthcare field, and anyone who's just struggling to stay safe during the pandemic. Um, with our PHS code, our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off of your mask. And if you buy through the method of with pre health shadowing, we will also get 10% of the proceeds. So you'll be able to donate to us and to those who need masks. And it's great because you're able to support a nonprofit. If you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, uh, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers. Uh, we have uh, two opportunities you can have. You can join our team member, our student team member, or you can be a uh, part of our uh, asynchronous volunteer team. And in our student uh, team member uh, group, we can lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach and grant writing and so much more. Uh, we understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So that's why we have a second opportunity called volunteering asynchronously. And you'll be able to do tasks on your own time and get your volunteer hours while giving into PHS. If you are a high school student and want to in get involved, we have a program called HTP, which stands for High School Training for PHS. And this allows you to get a head start in healthcare and learn more about healthcare by connecting you with college uh, pre-health programs and getting involved in fundraising for PHS and organizing resources for other high school students that are interested in medicine and healthcare through pre-health shadow. Uh, we want to recognize the hard work of all of our students. So if you happen to write any articles, reflections on the live sessions, reviews of pre-health shadowing or success stories of your own, you can definitely submit your writing using the link in the chat and you'll be able to get published through pre-health shadowing. So part of our mission at PHS is to promote diversity and we have our monthly panels that support this initiative and celebrates different demographics in the field of medicine. If you have a mentor, a professor, or professional in mind that has inspired you, then you can definitely contribute to these conversations by nominating them today using the link provided in the chat. And we humbly ask everyone that if you are able to donate to our program, you should, um, as you know, pre-health shadowing is completely student run. We are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. And unfortunately, Zoom and our website and the other platforms we are running are not free. So any contribution you are able to give would be greatly appreciated. If you are not financially able at the time, we request that you do send this link and uh, spread the word about pre-health shadowing so uh, you're able to help us out. So throughout the session, um, I encourage everyone to drop any uh, notes, to drop any questions in the chat. We will be asking the questions to the uh, professional at the end of our session. And also I want to, everyone to make sure to take good notes as our professional is going over their presentation. Uh, we will be having a post shadowing assessment. It's a small little quiz that will verify your virtual shadowing hours and taking good notes during the session will help prepare you to take the quiz. Lastly, if you are able to, we request that you turn your cameras on. It's no, by no means an obligation because we are respectful of your different circumstances. However, it does help us to feel a little closer together when we have to socially distance. And we also require everyone to make sure to mute yourself as this will ensure the professional has the complete and full attention from the audience. I appreciate everyone for listening. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Ellen Wood. Thank you so much for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, okay. Grace. Grace. How did I not share my screen? Did I share it? Am I sharing it? Yes, you're sharing it. Okay. You're sharing the wrong screen. I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay. I thought I had that taken care of. Where's the rest of my Google stuff? Okay, there. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm Dr. Ellen Wood. Um, and basically, this session is going to be on reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Um, definitely a very Subspecialized field, but it's really interesting. I mean, I take students in, in my office. Um, I have undergrads, I take medical students, and I'm training um, residents down here in uh, Miami Beach, Mount Sinai. Um, so they're all um, uh, also shadowing with me. But I am 
very impressed with the initial presentation I just saw in pre-health shadowing. I mean, you guys, you guys kind of got it going on here. Um, so what is a reproductive endocrinologist? I mean, like, you know, this is not a doctor that most people will go to. Most times you go see a family practice, you'll see a general, you know, pediatrician, but you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna really be familiar with what I do. So what we are, is we are a subspecialty of OBGYN. So in order to do what I do, I first have to be trained in, in, in obstetrics as well as gynecology. But basically, once I get that training, all I do all day is just make babies. Um, that's pretty much it. We do treat complex GYN problems because a lot of times if women have irregular menstrual cycles, if they have something called polycystic ovary syndrome, if they have endometriosis, uterine fibroids, some women have recurrent pregnancy loss and 40% of my business is male factor infertility. So this is a growing field, um, well, growing problem that we're seeing um, in the world, um, most likely from environmental causes. But I um, mean, 40% of my business is, is gentlemen. So, but mainly my focus is we try and help couples who are struggling to, to conceive um, have babies. Um, so how did I become an REI specialist? Okay. So first, again, I got into medical school and this was a given, but then I had to complete a four year OBGYN residency. Okay. So this is pretty standard. Um, I graduated from DO school. So at the time we had to do a, a rotating internship. I did a year um, rotating all the subspecialties. Then I applied for residency. Now you just apply directly to OBGYN residency. And so when you're an OBGYN resident, okay. And the reason that drew me to the field is that you get to go to clinic. So you get to see patients, you get to counsel them on birth control, you get to look at their complex GYN problems, you get to monitor their pregnancies, you learn to deliver babies, okay, which is a rush, okay, like that's why I went into the field, my first night on call as a third year med student, I delivered my first baby, I'm like, bam, this is what I want to do. Um, it was, it was just it, delivering a baby, if you ever have the opportunity, it is amazing. Um, and then the cool thing is that I'm a surgeon. So I love surgery. I mean, I'm very good with my hands. I'm a very good surgeon, but I didn't want to be a general surgeon. Like I didn't just want to do gallbladders and appendixes and bowel resections all day. I, I wanted to be a surgeon. And so in the OB residency, you were trained as a surgeon, you know, which was so cool. So you got to see patients in the clinic, you got to deliver babies as well as get surgical training that you, you know, operate on people, um, do C-sections, do hysterectomies, um, I mean, most of our stuff is robotic and laparoscopic now. We do hysteroscopies, laparoscopies. I mean, so many, so many different surgeries um, do you learn in residency, which is just so fun. Then if you want to go into a subspecialty, you need to complete a fellowship. So I did a three-year, um, OB, I mean, a reproductive endocrinology and fertility fellowship where you have also clinic responsibilities. But now you're not only trained as a surgeon, but you're trained as a reproductive surgeon. So you learn how to take care of very, very, very complicated surgical cases, as well as surgeries involving the fallopian tubes um, and, and the uterus. That is extra training than GYNs just get. Um, during fellowship, that's when you get all your publications, you do research, you publish. I mean, the fellows that we just hired um, last year, we had one out of Emory, one out of Columbia. I think they each had a couple publications, you know, five or six abstracts. I mean, they, they had, they, you know, lots of uh, presentations at, at, at national meetings. So you pursue research. And then the coolest thing, and this is the way the entire field is going now, okay, is you learn assisted reproductive technology or ART. So you learn how to do IVF, you learn how to take out eggs, um, you know, you learn the intricacies of ICSI, which is where we inject sperm into eggs. Um, right now, most of our patients are doing what we call PGTA, which is pre-implantation genetic testing um, to test the embryo for health even before it's replaced. I mean, this is the cutting edge of what we do. We do, we have andrology services in our, in our office. So where we do advanced sperm testing, we wash the sperm, um, we evaluate the sperm, you know, for its uh, capacity to fertilize eggs. And then we learn how to stimulate the ovaries with not only fertility pills, which is fertility medicine, we use fertility injections. So um, this is basically what I learned over, over, you know, what an REI learns over their se seven years of training. So it's seven years post-grad to do what I do. Um, now, there are four subspecialties of OBGYN. What I do, then there's maternal fetal medicine, which is high risk pregnancy, where you don't, you're not a surgeon. Um, basically, you learn those skills and then you pretty much don't do them anymore. And then um, you learn high risk pregnancy, where in some states, the maternal fetal medicine doctors still deliver babies. Okay. 
that was the case in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that you had definitely large groups of just doctors that were subspecialty trained in maternal fetal medicine. And so if your patient had diabetes as a, as a generalist, if your patient had high blood pressure, if your patient had something complicated going on with them, out they go, you know, they don't, you don't take care of them. You send them to the maternal fetal medicine specialist. And then that group of doctors is the ones that manage them. Um, Florida, MFM, great job, okay, because our MFMs don't deliver babies, and out where delivering babies is fun, the hours are terrible, okay, um, so the subspecialists down here in maternal field of medicine, they only do consultations, you go to the office, you talk to them about the risk of your pregnancy, they give your generalist the recommendations, your generalist follows those recommendations, so um, to be in maternal fetal medicine in South Florida is a, is a very nice life, um, just because the obstetrical piece is not there. Um, because obstetrics, again, it is just, it's very, very, very hard on your body getting up at three o'clock in the morning for 25 years. Um, the, four, the third specialty is gynecological oncology, which is cancer surgery. So just GYN cancer, cancer of the cervix, cancer of the uterus, cancer of the ovaries, um, cancer of the vagina, um, all of these things. And again, they are the rock stars in surgery in, in our, in the OBGYN field. So any complex case, these guys are completely subspecialty trained. You know, they can do, they can do anything in the operating room. Um, and then there's urogynecology, which is also does not deliver babies. Like the oncologists don't deliver babies, but they treat pelvic floor. So they treat bladder and, and pelvic floor um, issues. So they're the four specialties in OB that you're able to achieve a board certification in. So how do people get pregnant? Because again, when you talk to, when I see my residents that are rotating through my office, I mean, they just like, the first couple of days, their jaw drops. They're like, who are all these people that are coming to your office? Like they spend, as an OBGYN resident, literally, you spend your days counseling people about birth control. Like that's what you do. You're just giving out birth control pills and, and patches and things, um, you know, implants and, and IUDs, and, you know, because because people mostly most of the population is fertile. So most of the patients are trying to, you know, plan their pregnancies. So what do you need to get pregnant? Well, number one, a woman needs to have eggs. Okay. Cause if you're in menopause, you're out of eggs and you can't get a baby. So you need to ovulate. Once you have, once we know you have those eggs, the male partner needs to have enough sperm that are healthy and modal. A woman needs to have open fallopian tubes. This is where the sperm and the egg are going to meet. Then they have to have intercourse at the appropriate time and have sperm present before or during ovulation. Okay. Seems simple, but it is not. Some people, that's all we have to do is tell them actually, hey, this is your window of fertility. And, you know, then once we have educated them about when is the best time to have intercourse, they are subsequently pregnant. 85% um, of the population is fertile. And these are all the people that are seeking out birth control. However, I'm the doctor for the other 15% of the population that is having difficulties. The prevalence of infertility as people, women essentially delay childbearing, okay, is one in eight. We'll seek, we'll need the help of fertility specialist. And as I'm talking to, you know, students who are females who are planning to go into medicine one in four female physicians have fertility issues. This is the stats, this is true, this is real. And it's because we think number one, we learn in med school that medicine is wonderful and it can fix everything. And we delay childbearing. I mean, that is, that is the biggest issue. But we think because we're doctors, we can fix everything. Um, this is not the case. Um, I have doctors that come in and say, oh, I just need to do IVF. I'm like, no it's not going to work. You're too old. Like IVF cannot help you at this age. And they don't even, even though they are highly educated, do not know that age plays the biggest role in fertility. So hopefully I made that point because that's a big one. Um, but what do I do all day all along? I, I make babies and I figure out the problem. I offer the solution as to why a couple is having problems having the baby. I'm basically a detective who gathers clues to why the patient is in my office and, and not getting pregnant on her own, like 85% like of the population. So we focus in on the basics. A woman needs eggs, she needs to ovulate, a man needs sperm, he needs to be able to ejaculate. And we do have a fair amount of gentlemen who have erectile dysfunction. Um, we have a, actually couples who are not able to have intercourse. Um, so this is a true problem. Um, and then once we establish that we've got eggs and we're able to ejaculate, the woman needs to have open fallopian tubes in order for the sperm and the egg to find each other. 
Um, it seems very fundamental, but um, for many people, this basic biology, um, they, they don't really understand it. So we start off with education um, pretty much at any new patient visit. So they know what I'm trying to educate them on and what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so let's talk anatomy. Just again, I know you guys are undergrads, you're very smart, so you've taken biology, um, but sometimes reproduction just eludes people um, and they're, they're not really aware of how everything works. So this is your vagina. When you have intercourse again, the sperm get deposited here at the mouth of the cervix, okay? Only one to 3% of the sperm are even gonna make it up through the cervix and into the uterus. Once that one to 3% of the sperm makes it up there, they have to head on out the fallopian tubes, okay? And then these are the ovaries out here. And basically what has to happen is that the fallopian tube, the fingers on the fallopian tube have to catch the egg. And this in the tube is where the sperm and the egg meet. It hang, the sperm and the egg meet here, and then it takes it about five days to mosey on down into the uterus and implant. Um, so these are just, you know, simple basics, but, you know, many patients do not, you know, understand it. I had a lady come in the, the other day and she wanted to be, she was a same sex couple and she wanted to carry for her partner or she's, the partner's 30, the patient was 45 and she had already had four children from a previous relationship. And she was very worried that I was gonna tell her that she could not carry her partner's baby because she had a tubal ligation. And I was like, huh? I'm like, no, like you have a uterus. This is where we put the embryo. Like you don't need tubes to get pregnant with IVF. Um, so that's why, again, I try to educate patients to the basics, like, cause she didn't realize that the fallopian tubes, you know, weren't an integral part of getting pregnant, especially when we're making embryos in a laboratory. Um, so how did I become an REI? Like this was not a lifelong dream since the first test tube baby was born in 1978. And this was me in Catholic school in 1980. Um, so this wasn't, this, this, this wasn't something that, you know, like, you know, I was in high school. Oh, this is what I want to do. Like this, this is definitely, definitely, definitely not, um, you know, something that, that I've always aspired to is something that I kind of fell into and just, and just loved as it, as I fell into it. Um, but this is, um, uh, Louise Brown, okay, um, Steptoe and Edwards were the physicians um, in Great Britain who um, discovered um, that we can make babies in a test tube, and so she was the first one, and Louise Brown was born in 1978. Um, then, in 1981, um, you know, this technology, you know, flew across the pond, and we were able to achieve um, success with the first test tube baby in the US. And her name is Elizabeth Carr um, and Howard and Georgiana Jones. Um, Howard is still living, he's like 95 years old. Um, I saw him speak about five years ago at age 90. Um, his poor wife, um, Georgiana, she is uh, passed away. Um, she developed Alzheimer's, but these were the um, pioneers um, at the Jones Institute in Virginia of, of in vitro in the US. Um, I trained in Philadelphia and um, the head of my practice, who's now probably 90 as well, um, he started his practice in 1984. Um, and we were the first IVF clinic um, in um, Pennsylvania. So why did I wanna become a doctor? Well, again, as I said earlier, detective work. It's, that's all I do all day. I've had, the, I've had my undergraduate student actually said that to me. Um, this, this month she's rotating with me in July and she's like, you're just like a detective all day. And I'm like, pretty much. Um, so basically we take a history, we take a physical, we gather evidence. But when I was young, these were the type of books that I read, like, you know, Hardy Boys, I mean, I mean, knows what they are, you know, the Nancy Drew, the three investigators, Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen. I mean, this was like the stuff that I read as, as a child, because we did not have, you know, internet. Um, we had three channels on television. Um, we did not have smartphones. It was still a landline, you know, so actually we read. So I had libraries and libraries of all these mystery books, but um, you know, this is what I think, you know, this is why I went into medicine. And again, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different fields of medicine. And we all are, we all are kind of detectives, especially like my daughter, um, her um, motivation going into medicine is house. House is the TV show that she grew up watching. And she's like, and that's what drew her to medicine because she doesn't really like what I do or what her father does. Um, he's also a physician, but um, oh, she, she, she liked what House did. So, you know, different things motivate us um, to help us choose our pathway. Um, so this is just my personal journey. I mean, everybody's journey is gonna be different, but you know, you figure you graduate top in your high school class as a National Merit Scholar. 
Um, I got into University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League school. I started off as a biology major and I'm like, yep, I am going to be a doctor, okay? Well, I started off as a biology major and I'm like, I hate this. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not good. Like, how am I gonna be a doctor and I hate biology? It wasn't that I hated biology, I hated the people in my biology classes. And that's not me. Like that's, I, I, I am a friendly person. I, I, I help people. I was always, I, I never was a cutthroat person. I just did my own thing and you get good grades, you get good grades, but you're not trying to screw somebody out of something or, 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 you know, trying to tend to kick somebody off the pedestal just, you know, to get your own good grade. And this is the way it was back in the eighties. And I'm, I don't know if it's still that way, but this is back, This is the way it was back in the eighties at University of Pennsylvania is that, you know, everybody is out for themselves. And I'm like, you know what? I don't wanna be around these people for the rest of my life. Um, so I changed my major. Um, all of my pre-med classes got thrown into my electives. And I took up a major with international relations with a minor in Spanish. I took political science classes with wonderful people. I took history classes with wonderful people. I took economics classes with us, so people, because they were all at Wharton. Um, and then I had a minor in Spanish. And so we took Spanish poetry and Spanish literature and Spanish reading. It was just, I felt very, very well-rounded um, from that. So then how does medical school happen? Like, it's like, okay, she's got this degree. It's not biology. Um, you know, she doesn't really like the people. How does she become a doctor? Um, well, my undergraduate experience, I love sports, okay? So at the time I was this tiny little 115 pound female and I had, in high school, my, my friends were all rowers. So people from the Northeast, you know, it's a big sport up there, especially Rutgers, Philadelphia. Um, you know, crew is, at the time, it wasn't as big as it is now, but it still was a big thing if you lived in Philadelphia. So when I went to college, I had joined the men's heavyweight crew team as a freshman and I was a coxswain. So they needed little people. That's me in the front here. Um, they needed little people to steer the boat and to tell the very large six, two plus um, men what to do. So this was, and I loved it because these were all my friends from high school and it was super fun. Um, it was six days a week practice. That's what crew's all about. It's, it's, it's Monday through Friday and then Saturday mornings. So I did that for two years and then I became the woman's varsity coxswain as a junior and I was a varsity Ivy League athlete at that time because the freshman I was like a 3V and then I moved up to JV with the men but I could be, I did, I played, I was varsity with the women. So, um, and crew, if anybody has ever done it, it is, it, this is a grueling sport. This takes, you know, two to three hours out of your day, six days a week, the only day off literally. And it's a full, it's a year long sport. There, there is no, there is no time off. Um, so my father thought I'd make a good doctor and I still wasn't really enthused about the whole thing. Um, so I quit crew as a senior, which was depressing um, to focus on medical school. So I got a research job, um, a work study, and it was like, I got to use a little guillotine and, and cut the heads off of rats and open them up and take the little brains and weigh them and then stick them in a blender um, and then freeze them so they could do lipid studies on them later after because the rats had been exposed to different chemicals. Um, and I blended up their little brains. So I'm thinking, all right, yep, finally got some research under my belt. Like I'm, 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 you know, at least I've got some sort of medical something. I have like basically all electives that I did okay in, but they're all my med school, um, you know, stuff. I don't really have anything outstanding in biology. <laughs> so now I got a little bit of neurosurgical research on rats. Um, so I went back, I toured medical schools. I, I toured Jefferson, I toured Hahnemann. Um, I toured MCP, uh, didn't, doesn't exist anymore, but um, I toured all these medical schools and I'm like, no, these are the same people that I was in biology with. Nope, not doing it. Um, so I, I went to Philadelphia Osteopathic. I toured them. Nicest people you ever did meet. I mean, these are just really, really normal people. Like these were people you could talk to, look like they had your back. I mean, these are just people that took me on the tour and I got that vibe. So I went home and I said to my dad, you know what, dad, it's 10 minutes down the road from where I live. Okay, I'm from Philadelphia. 10 minutes down the road from where I live, I'll apply. So I applied. And then I got in. <laughs> so that's that's the story. Um, was it wasn't wasn't any any long complicated journey. However, however, my point of putting crew into um, my slide presentation is that so I'm all prepared. I'm all prepared. I have all the the lipid research and everything in my head. I'm like, okay, this is why I was cutting little heads off of rats, and this is why I was doing it. Okay, do you know what we talked about for half an hour at my interview? Crew. That's all they wanted to know about. That's it. What do I do? And I said, well, I get the five o'clock every morning. 
I am right now at varsity four. I pick up my, I pick up the girls. I, I drive them to the river, blah, blah, blah. We are away every weekend with, with, you know, we go up and down the East coast on in the spring season. Um, the fall we have regattas, we have head races. And I have literally for a half an hour, all three of those two doctors. I remember Dr. Angeloni and Dr. Helwig. And then the, the Dean of admissions was in front of me. And that's, that's pretty much all they asked me. I walked out of that interview and I said, they didn't even want to know about the rats. I was so depressed. Um, but anyway, two months later, I got an acceptance letter. So I, I guess they liked what I had to say about crew. But I do think that that sports and being well-rounded, um, again, in, in a lot of different schools, and every school is going to be different. Um, but I do think that the commitment that I had to the crew team with this six-day-a-week practice you, you, you have to compare that to medicine because that's the commitment that, that you have to be to be a doctor. I, I mean, you know, this is not a, you know, crew is not an easy sport and most, you know, varsity Ivy League sports are, are not easy sports. So um, I think that, you know, that the commitment and dedication that I did have to crew for three years, um, I, I think was definitely something that, that helped me um, get accepted. I mean, my grades were okay. My MCAT was okay, but this, you know, it wasn't anything over the top. Um, but it was, it was acceptable. But um, I, I definitely think that being that well-rounded individual with um, learning other things, my history, my political science, as well as um, paying clue, I think it, it did help with my medical school admission. Um, since, you know, my father's a dentist, but no one in my, no one in my family is, was a doctor um, by far. Um, so I graduated PCOM 1992, did that rotating internship in 93, did my residency in 97. Um, with along with my residency, we were able to get a master's degree. So I wrote a thesis um, and got a master's degree also from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in 97. Um, I got accepted to my fellowship. Um, and so I started at Pennsylvania Hospital and then I finished at Jefferson because of the political environment and hospitals buying up hospitals. I had to train at two places. And then I started practice as an assistant professor at Hahnemann, um, right? Rest in peace. And I, academics were not for me academics were just not for me. I, I mean, it was just, it was, I was not busy enough. Um, basically, they were not giving me enough clinic sessions. I mean, I was teaching the residents, which was very, very nice. I was doing lots of surgery with the residents, but it was very, it was very kind of more of a low, laid back kind of a nine to five, like, all right, let's publish some papers. Let's do a little research. Let's see a few patients type of thing. Um, and I came from a very, very, very busy, um, again, as I said, one of the first IVF practice in Philadelphia. And we were busy. We were clinical. We were busy. Even though we published, we, we were we were busy. And so I saw at that out that, that experience to the same thing. And that's how I ended up in Florida. And I joined this practice in Florida, um, October of 2000. And I was 30 weeks pregnant with my with my second daughter at the time. And I've been there ever since. So it was a pretty interesting, you know, windy journey, but it definitely wasn't something that was planned. Um, when I had done my REI in residency, the reason that I wanted to pursue a fellowship was because my husband or my fiance at the time was also OBGYN and one of us needed to have a normal life. So I sold him, you go off, be the REI. He went and did the rotation. He comes home. He's like, I hate this. I'm like, no, 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 you can't hate this. You're going to be the subspecialist. I'll deliver the babies. Cause I said, I enjoyed delivering babies. And he just didn't like to do it. So he's the guy who's up all night, three o'clock in the morning, you know, coming back at six, going back to work at night. Like he's, he's the guy who's killing himself right now. And I have a pretty nice, you know, some days seven to four, some days nine to four, um, you know, life. So REI is, is a nice life. And so I just kind of fell into it because I liked it and he didn't, um, even though the plan was for him to do this. Um, so now I wear this white coat and I'm a detective in the fertility world. So let's just talk a little bit about infertility. So when students come to shadow me, um, basically we just start off and we kind of like teach them what is infertility and what's normal, what's not normal. So couples having regular unprotected intercourse, about half of them are gonna conceive in three months because again, there's no problems. If it doesn't take you three months, maybe your timing's off. So 70% will conceive in six months, 85% will conceive in a year. And then if you keep going, 90% will probably conceive in two years. Um, so what is the definition of infertility? So it's really the failure to conceive after one year of regular unprotected intercourse, okay? So again, this is fundamental because a lot of patients come to me and they're like, oh, so how often do you have intercourse? They're like, once a month. Like, Not quite enough. Um, so that is, you have to be having regular intercourse, you know, two to three times a week. Um, and then if you have not conceived, then that is when either your regular gynecologist or you as a patient should seek my help. Okay. And infertility affects 10 to 15% of couples, two different types of infertility. We've got primary, 
no pregnancies, okay? And secondary, patients already had a pregnancy and now she can't get pregnant. So these are the definitions that you know, are really important to determine, you know, is this her, you know, she's never gotten pregnant or something, something happened to her after her pregnancy that's now causing a problem. Um, now, there are some special cases. So, and this is where age comes in. Age, 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 age. I cannot state it enough. Um, so if you're over 35 and you're trying for six months, okay, you really should see me. Or if you have irregular periods, so you're not bleeding, all right? You're not bleeding, you're not ovulating, okay? Or if your periods are sporadic, you know, I get a period every three months, okay? You're probably not ovulating, gonna make it hard to get pregnant. Um, if you knew you had PID or chlamydia in the past, or you know you have fibroids, which are growth tumors in the uterus, then, then you should seek fertility specialist um, help earlier than later. Or if your male partner has an inkling, he, he might be, be not be fertile. The problem with guys is you can have the best looking, healthiest guy in front of you and he can have no sperm. And you're like, this makes no sense. Um, but this is, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing guys that you'd never, ever, ever suspect. So we never, never, never skimp on the male evaluation, no matter how healthy the gentleman says he is. So what causes infertility? So again, ovulatory problems are our biggest, biggest problem, okay? Premature ovarian failure, which means you run out of eggs too soon. I mean, I have patients, and not a lot of them, but maybe I see one or two a year who actually went into menopause in their 20s. So this is premature ovarian failure. I have some patients who, for some reason, their pituitary gland in their uterus and their ovaries don't talk. That's what we call hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, where the pituitary just doesn't send the right signals and tell the ovary what to do. This is real. Rare though, rare though, I have maybe one, two patients a year. One of the biggest causes of hypohypogonadism is too much exercise. So if you are doing high intensity exercise and you're like a long distance runner and stuff, that shuts off your periods. Um, but that causes hypohypo. Um, PCOS, huge cause of, I mean, that is the bulk of my business is PCOS. It's, a, it's an endocrine disorder that um, causes women not to ovulate on a regular basis. But again, very, very, very successful in treating it. And then problems with your milk hormone or your prolactin disorders. So that means your pituitary gland is sending out too much milk hormone and extra prolactin will suppress ovarian function. So the other causes are again, your uterus, your endometrium is not right. That's the lining of your uterus or there's distortion or growths in your uterus. Tubal blockage, gonna cause problems. Cervical stenosis, um, that's where the mouth of the womb gets either you know, stuck shut, whether you had cervical dysplasia, a bad pap smear and they froze your cervix or they cut a piece off of your cervix or you had some sort of trauma to your cervix, um, that will cause the sperm from making it through. And then there's male factor infertility. And these are these basically these very, these definitions of male fertility. So azospermia, no sperm, oligo, low sperm, asthenospermia, low sperm motility, and then teratospermia, abnormal sperm morphology, which means the head and the neck and the tail are messed up on the sperm. So most patients, we find one of these issues and then we address them for the treatment. Um, but in about 15% of the patients, we don't find anything and they're what we consider unexplained infertility. So again, these are the multiple causes. Sometimes you'll have both. Sometimes people just like, are just not lucky. He has a low sperm count and she doesn't ovulate. Like I have patients who just have the trifecta of fertility. You know, she has tubal blockage, doesn't ovulate and he has a low sperm count. So there's no rule that says you, you only know, get one problem. Um, but couples who seem to have problems just seem to attract each other. Um, so you can have multiple factors, again, tubal, ovulatory, diminished ovarian reserve is when, again, you're running out of eggs, endometriosis, uterus, male. And then again, there's other little factors in there, timing um, issues that, that can also happen, especially if your husband you know, travels for work and stuff like that, and you're, she's not around when you're ovulating. So how do we evaluate this initially? So basically, we do medical history of female and male partner. We do a focused physical exam, basically looking at their fertility. We do a semen analysis. We look for ovulation. We check their egg reserve. We check their tubes, their uterus. And then we do lots of preconception counseling because, again, sometimes as I said, it's really simple. It's just timing or they just don't understand, you know, how fertility works. So what do we look for in the female partner? How long she's been prob having problems? How often she has sex? Super important. Um, and then has she ever had any prior evaluation or treatment? Has she been pregnant before? What are her menstrual patterns? Does she have painful periods? Because painful periods can sometimes indicate that maybe she has a disease called endometriosis, which we see a lot. Has she ever had sexually transmitted diseases, gonorrhea, chlamydia? Um, those are notorious for causing tubal damage. Has she ever had surgery, cervix, uterus, 
um, ovaries, tubes, and then appendix. That's a big one. If you had a ruptured appendix, most of those patients are going to have problems with um, infection in their belly after their appendix ruptured, and there's a high, high, high incidence of tubal factor. Um, we're going to look at her medical and surgical history. Does she have blood pressure? Does she have diabetes? Has she had surgery on her pelvis before? Has she had uh, cysts on her ovaries removed? We're going to look at her medications. We're going to look at her habits like drinking, smoking, um, all not good if you're trying to get pregnant. Um, we're going to look um, at her family history. When did her mom go through menopause? Do they carry any genetic disease? All of these are clues. Like the, every single time I have a conversation with a woman, I'm just trying to pull different clues from her. Like, all right, what could this be? What could this be? And the whole time in my head, what could this be? What could this be? Because I haven't even examined her yet. I'm just, I haven't even done ultrasound. I haven't even looked at her, but like what in her history, you know, might be preventing her from getting pregnant. So this is what's going on in my head the whole, whole time we're sitting there and interviewing the patient. And then with the guy, okay, has he ever had a sperm checked in fertility or urology evaluation? Has he ever had kids before? Has he had an injury to his testicles? Because if you have significant testicular trauma, okay, it can cause something called anti-sperm antibodies and your sperm can actually become allergic to each other. I see this maybe once or twice a year, but it's real. Um, and it, it can cause significant problems because the antibodies get gummed up all over the head of the sperm and the sperm can't make their way into the eggs. Did he have undescended testicles as a baby? Okay, because this is bad. If you don't pull those testicles down as a baby, I had one poor gentleman, it was so sad. He broke into tears in my office. His testicles were brought down at age 12 in Australia and he was told it would be fine, okay? Well, we did a semen analysis on him, zero sperm. And it's because his testicles were not brought down surgically, you know, early enough. And he was the, the, literally the, the man broke out into tears in my office. And his, his and I, you know, I, I said to him, we can get a biopsy and check for sperm. But I said, you're probably going to have to use donor sperm. And, and I, literally, I think the wife divorced him. Like she was like yelling at him in the office. It was terrible. It was, it was so sad to see a grown man cry. Um, and then the other thing, which is also correctable, is actually a varicocele. So varicocele is a bag of varicose veins around the testicle, and that can be surgically ligated. And if and there's heat that it that comes around the testicle. So if you ligate these veins, the testicles no longer are kind of boiling because the blood in the veins in the testicles is body temperature. So testicles are where they are because they don't like body temperature, okay? They like it a little cooler, so that's why they hang down. Um, and if you're circulating dilated veins with hot blood around the testicle year after year after year, sometimes the testicle can shrink and it can decrease sperm production. If you ligate those veins surgically, and there's urologists who do that, um, sometimes the testicles will start to grow sperm at a better rate. It's 50-50 after a surgery, whether it's gonna help or not. But again, it's, it's at least worth a try. Um, we look at the guy's medical and surgical history again. Has he has hernia repairs? Um, does he take medications? Medications are a huge, huge, huge problem um, when we're talking about fertility. So you have a guy come in, he's on a cholesterol medicine, he's on a blood pressure medicine, he's on a gout medicine, he's on this. All of these medicines can potentially really harm the sperm. So we have to, we have to definitely look at that. Um, so what diseases does he have and what medications is he on? He may want to need to change medication. Um, I published an article with my daughter, um, we got it published, was it maybe February, I get no, I don't know, maybe six months ago. Anyway, it was on a guy who was taking Ritalin, okay, for ADHD, and they changed him to Adderall, okay, which has really never been tested in adults, and he had two kids and he had a miscarriage for his wife. I was seeing his wife to evaluate her for miscarriage. Anyway, so we, she wasn't getting pregnant, she wasn't getting pregnant. I said, well, let's check your husband. Guy comes back, zero sperm. The only thing that changed between him having these three pregnancies with his wife, okay, and him having zero sperm was the Adderall. So it took us, I think, four or five months after he stopped the Adderall for his sperm actually to be produced again. So the Adderall was doing something up here to the, to the way his brain and his testicles worked um, to affect his um, sperm production. But thank God it did reverse itself once the medication was taken away. So this is very, very, very important in a history. Again, still thinking, thinking, thinking all the time. What could it be? What could it be? What could it be? Um, and then we want to look at habits. Okay, smoking decreases the sperm's potential. Marijuana can mess up your sperm. It can fragment the DNA and cause a huge problem. Excess of alcohol can cause sperm to be poorly produced. Um, so all of these things are super, super, super important when we're on this quest to figure out what is wrong with this couple. And then you look at his family history. 
anybody in the family not being able to have kids? Is there any genetic diseases? And this can give us a clue about other things that we wanna, we wanna test and look for. So now we're up to the physical exam. We took the history. So now we're gonna like, all right, let's go examine you. So we do a woman's um, height and weight and we look at her BMI. Because if you're severely underweight, your ovaries shut down. If you're overweight, your ovaries can shut down. If you're obese, your ovaries can shut down. So weight is really, really, really critical um, for a lot of patients, not all, but for a lot of patients who are having trouble conceiving because it can screw up your ovulation. We look at their thyroid, make sure they don't have a goiter, make sure that their thyroid isn't overactive or underactive because this can also mess up your ovulation. We let check their breasts. If they have nipple discharge, they may be running prolactin levels that are too high. And as I stated earlier, prolactin can suppress ovulation. Then we look at their skin. We look to see if they have acne, very common in polycystic ovary patients. We look to see if they have any excessive hair, balding up here, excessive chin hair, excessive chest hair. And then we also look for something that's called acanthosis nigrans, which is brown spots on the back of the neck, sometimes in the thighs, sometimes in the intragenous areas and underneath the arms. And this is a sign of insulin resistance, which goes hand in hand of, for PCOS. All these are just clues as to what we might find once we order um, a blood evaluation. So, the next part of the analysis is gonna be again, the sperm test. Um, Cause I don't do an examination of the male partner. I'm not a urologist. I just order the tests on him. Um, if we do think it's the male partner, they will get referred to a urologist. So the urologist can do that physical exam and look for the varicocele or look for um, testicles that haven't been descended properly. So I just order the test on the guy, I don't examine him. Um, so I order a semen analysis. So these are instructions for a semen analysis that we give patients every day. You need to abstain from ejaculating for two to five days. And then you need to collect the sample by masturbation. Do not use lubricants, okay? Some lubricants will kill the sperm. We need at least one semen analysis that abnormal, then we'll repeat it in six to eight weeks because it takes 72 to 90 days to make a sperm. So they could differ. Um, and then we'll refer to urologist if there is abnormalities in the sperm for them to perform the physical exam. So again, a guy's sperm count can be normal. But you'd be surprised, as I said, only one to 3% of the sperm make it into the uterus. So sometimes, sometimes you really need to give them direction, okay? And, and I'll show you a short video on how we do that later on. So this is a normal semen analysis. So again, these are sperm, okay? This is the head of the sperm, neck of the sperm, tail of the sperm, okay? And this is what we do when we do morphology, we stain them. And so my andrologists look at stains like this all day. But reference values for normal is gonna be a normal ejaculate is only basically one and a half to 6.8 cc's. So you don't have to fill the cup, just a two cc's of liquid is all we need. Um, the concentration per cc, okay, or per ml should be greater than 15 million. A normal sperm count, 39 million. So we're talking 39 million to one, okay? One egg, 39 million sperm. I mean, the ratio there, I mean, this is why most people are fertile. Um, the sperm should be moving at 40%, progressive motility, um, should be greater than 32% and normal morphology should be 4%. So you only actually need 4% of the sperm to have a normal head, neck, and tail. So this, hopefully this video works. This is basically when you give us a semen analysis, what our office looks like. So <laughs> All right, so that's just a quick view of our, our collection room. We have the guy come in, that's a nice collection room. This is our andrology lab with our andrologists and their microscopes and their computer. Um, and they're gonna be advanalyzing the sperm from <laughs> okay. All right, so that's the sperm test, okay? So that's just the basic evaluation for the guy. So how do we detect ovulation in the woman? Okay, that's the next thing. And so first of all, as I talked about with history, okay, we're gonna do menstrual history, determine if they're ovulating, look at their cycle length. Most ovulatory menstrual cycles, 21 to 35 days. So if someone says they're irregular, even if their days vary a little bit, that's still actually regular, okay? But menstrual cycles can occur even if you're not ovulating, okay? So this is called anovulatory bleeding. So it doesn't guarantee that you're actually ovulating. Um, sometimes, again, we'll ask them their symptoms. Do you get breast tenderness before ovulation? Do you get mood changes? And again, if they do have these changes, it means their hormones are changing, which means their ovary is producing different hormones. And, and that can indicate to the doctor that yeah, she's probably ovulating. This is probably not what her problem is. But the best way to do it at home, if you don't want to see the doctor, is going to be to buy one of these little ovulation predictor kits, okay? They were not available 25 years ago. Now there's like 
tons of different brands and you can buy them in Target and Walgreens and any, any, anywhere has them. Um, and it will detect LH in a woman's urine and LH is the hormone that the pituitary gland secretes in order to start the ovulatory process. So when a woman detects a positive surge on her kit, and it's a little smiley face with those two lines on it, she will ovulate 24 to 36 hours later. Okay, so it's not like, you know, they get a positive and they need to make their husband come home from work. No, that's not the case. It's like, you know, she can do the positive in the morning and, you know, she can she can make him a nice dinner when he gets home um, and they can, they can work on things at night. Um, so ovulation predictor kits are what most of the patients are using. And I have to say more than 50% are using them by the time they come to my office. So I have an idea and they come to me like, nope, those kits don't work. I bought, you know, tons of boxes of them and they don't work. We're all like, bingo, she's got an ovulation problem. Um, Mid-luteal progesterone is a progesterone test that we check um, one week after ovulation. It needs to be greater than three to say, yep, she ovulated. If it's less than three, nope, she did not. The way I do it in my office is with vaginal ultrasound, and that's how I check for the follicles. Um, so it's really easy. You put an ultrasound in, you're like, oh, there's your follicle. Um, and it's super fast, super easy. Um, we don't have to work with urine. We don't have to guess. But again, I'm a subspecialist doctor. And again, most people don't want to come and see me until they're absolutely positively sure they need me. So they're not going to, um, you know, be, be having ultrasounds all the time. So to just do stuff at home, the ovulation predictor kit. And then if you don't feel like buying an ovulation predictor kit or it's out of your budget, okay, you can retrospectively use a basal body temperature chart and you can track your temperatures just with a thermometer. You put it in your mouth, you know, every morning before you can't move, put it in your mouth, chart it 97.9, 97.9, 97.9. And then you'll see a little dip. And then once that temperature spikes up above 98, you have progesterone in your body, okay? Progesterone is a, what we call a thermogenic hormone, okay? The problem is once you have progesterone in your body, deal's done, can't get pregnant. So basal body temperature charts are not good at saying, oh, this is the time to have intercourse, but done over a series of months, you can say temperature low, drop, spike, temperature low, drop, spike, all right, she is probably ovulating and they bring, you know, the papers into you to show you, but it's not useful as far as um, detecting when to have intercourse, just retrospectively saying, yeah, probably ovulation is, is not her issue. Um, so medical history, again, we've been through a lot of this. Um, I think oh, that's a double slide. Sorry about that. Um, and that's so menstrual irregularities. What causes them? PCOS, we check testosterone levels. We try to rule out something called CAH, which is um, congenital adrenal hypoplasia, thyroid dysfunction, prolactin dysfunction, the hypothalamus not functioning, as well as premature ovarian insufficiency. Now, this is the big one, ovarian reserve, that female physicians should really be aware of, okay? And if you are going into medicine, you need to check your ovarian reserve to see whether you are one of going to be at risk, okay, to be one of the patients who might have problems. So women are born with a set number of eggs, gametes, okay? The maximum number you have is 7 million when you are seven months in utero, okay? Start off with 7 million. By the time you're born, we're down to a million, okay? Like talk about the attrition rate. By the time you have your first menstrual cycle, we're down to 300,000, okay? So these eggs die off fast. But if you only want two kids, you know, 300,000 eggs should be enough. Um, and then menopause is basically when we have zero. So over here in these charts, it's in your 30s, this is when the monthly fertility rate starts to decline, okay? And even IVF, this is ART, as I said, birth rate still decreases with women's age. So IVF and assisted reproductive technology cannot fight aging, cannot fight aging. And most female physicians we're gonna go through, again, you know, we do college and then we do our gap years and then we work a little bit and then we get into med school. And then by the time we're 30, we get a residency and then we do seven years of post-grad training. And here we find ourselves just starting practice at 37 and 38. And we haven't even thought about having kids yet. I mean, this is where physicians get into problems. Um, and so if this, if you're considering delaying your childbearing to complete your education, okay, Um, how to determine whether you're at risk is again, FSH levels. And so FSH levels are drawn, stands for follicle stimulating hormone, hormone in your pituitary glands, tells your ovaries to make eggs. Um, 
And the levels typically in menopause are gonna be greater than 20. And we do not want the level greater than 10, that gets concerning, and the estrogen level greater than 80, it's associated with poor egg quality and fertility. And even just a single FSH level in that abnormal range suggests that that woman is going to have problems and we may not be able to help her even with high tech stuff. But this is the test that is super, super, super easy. Um, anybody in the Northeast may be familiar with it. I mean, there's like a little AMH van, like driving around saying, hey, check your fertility. And what they're checking is gonna be an AMH. AMH test is gonna be something that is a hormone produced by your granulosa cells. They're in your ovaries, okay? And it's gonna reflect how many eggs you have, okay? Compared to other women your age. And if you find in your you know, early 20s or early 30s that your AMH level is low and you don't wanna have a kid yet, freeze your eggs. Please freeze your eggs. Again, I have mentioned it to both of my children who are going into medicine. Um, mommy will be freezing your eggs by the time you're 25 just to give you options. Okay, if you don't want your eggs, you can sell them, you can throw them away. But I mean, I think it's a smart thing for anybody who knows they're going to be delaying their childbearing. And the other way we look at egg reserve is just an ultrasound. We look at your ovaries and count the little follicles and just see how healthy they look. But the AMH is the test that if anybody wants a snapshot of their fertility and they're in their 20s, this is the test that is super important because it will give you an idea of do you have an abundance of eggs or do you, are you lacking eggs and you could be at risk for infertility in the future if you don't have your kids young. Okay, so the last next thing we look at is tubes. Okay, so we look at the patency of the tubes, what can damage them, PID, ruptured appendix, prior surgery, endometriosis, lots and lots of different causes. Um, how do we check for the tubes? So we look for a test called an HSG. This is an x-ray, okay, sequential x-rays. And then we use the medium, I put a little catheter in the uterus. Um, and again, my students who follow me, like they, they like literally, I do five and six of these a day because um, it's a very, very quick test. It's, you don't need anesthesia for it, minimal cramps, and it's, it's very easy to do in the office. We get results right away, um, but it lets us know with 80% certainty, do we have a tubal problem or not? Other ways to evaluate tubes are going to be laparoscopy, which is surgery. So we really need to, we really need to do, you know, big stuff with that. Like we got to put general anesthesia and we got to operate on you and put knives and needles and sharp objects into your belly, blow it up with gas and take a look. But it's a little more accurate than the HSG, but it's much, much, much more involved. And then we can do a test called a water ultrasound and we can put water and bubbles into your uterus and see whether the bubbles go out your fallopian tubes on ultrasound. And then we can screen you whether you'd be at risk. Um, with a chlamydial antibody. So if you, lots of people did not know they ever were infected with chlamydia, your blood knows though. So your blood will have an antibody just like you get for an antibody for German measles or an antibody for chicken pox. You know, it's an antibody that says, uh-oh, I had chlamydia in the past and I didn't know it, it was never treated, maybe my tubes are damaged. So this is something that I screen all of my patients with. Um, so this is what an x-ray looks like. The uterus is this triangle, okay, as we showed back in the anatomy. These little white line, that's the, that's the fallopian tube spilling the dye. This is the right fallopian tube spilling the dye. And this is an abnormal study with both of these tubes being severely damaged and blocked on the ends. So this is my little video of how we do the x-ray. It's a okay, 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 okay. That was just my quick okay, okay. Like version of that. Um, so that's the way we check out tubes. And now uterus, um, if we think that the uterus needs to be evaluated, there might be a problem. That's the next thing we check. We can look at it on the x-ray. We can do the water ultrasound, or we can put an actual scope and go to surgery and put it into a hysteroscopy with a little scope in the uterus. You can also look for anomalies on a 3D ultrasound or an MRI. Um, we can also assess the inside of the uterus to see whether the lining is infected or it has a um, hormonal problem. Um, and that's with a little biopsy of the uterus. So that the uterine evaluation is similar to a tubal. They kind of do a lot of overlap. And then some additional management points, okay? We try to counsel patients, as I said in the beginning, about their natural fertility, because sometimes people don't need me. And I call these things handshake pregnancies. So sometimes we evaluate them, we talk to them, we basically explain to them their anatomy, we tell them when's the best time to have intercourse, and they get pregnant, like they call us up two weeks later, like, I'm pregnant, we're like, hey, nice meeting you. Um, so the best time to frequency of intercourse is, is one, to, one to two days, it's gonna give you your highest pregnancy rate, nearly equivalent with two to three times a week if you're not doing the timing or the ovulation kit. Your fertile window can span six days, okay? Ending with your day of ovulation because sperm can live for five days. 
I mean, those little guys, they can just, they can stay moving for a long time waiting for that egg. So if you ovulate on day 14, you had sex on day eight. Yes, you could become pregnant. Um, but intercourse prior to ovulation is going to be the most important thing again, it's because the lifespan of the sperm and then the ovulation predictor kits are going to really hone in on the window. And then we try to have patients avoid spermicides. So a lot of things in KY and astroglide and things that people are going to lose from lubrication are going to kill sperm. So, and they don't know that. I mean, literally I have people come in, oh yeah, we've been using KY. I'm like, well, I, and I'll, I tell them to stop it. And a month later they call us that they're pregnant. That's all they needed to do. So these are very, very simple things, but a lot of my world now, as, as fellows are coming out, is focused on IVF, 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 IVF. And all you had to do was tell them to stop using KY. Um, so this is why the basics in the history and physical um, are super, super, super important because IVF is not the answer for everybody. And then as we talked about weight, goal of healthy weight. We want diet and exercise to be a part of everything. And then lifestyle, avoid tobacco, marijuana. And duration. Um, so the next couple of slides are just, uh, you know, short little clips of, of basically what I do all day. Um, I thought they were kind of cute. Um, they're very, they're very short and easy to, easy to, easy to watch. So this is the day, day in the life of what I do. So that's basically what I do. I, I basically do x-rays, I do saline sonograms, I do OB ultrasounds, I do consultations. And then um, what we do for male factor infertility um, is the next little thing. Let's see. So this is basically um, a procedure called IUI or intrauterine insemination. And this is also a daily staple. We do probably four or five, six of these in our office a day for guys with either low sperm counts or if the patient couple is having intercourse and the sperm just don't seem to be getting where they need to be. Basically what the mainstay of our profession is, it's doing in vitro and this is how we get out the eggs. In summary, okay, I know it's a comprehensive talk. Again, there's just, a, you can't not do a comprehensive talk because there's so many different little things we investigate, but infertility is common and can result from many causes. The exam should start with the medical history, focus physical exam on both partners. The, the evaluation consists of semen analysis, making sure you're ovulating and assessment of the tubes. We test for egg reserve, uterine factors, male factors should be tailored to each individual case. A treatment plan is then developed based on, it, based on the evaluation. We should always counsel people to maximize their natural fertility, and then patients should be aware of their prognosis and option for family building. So one last little quote, just again, it's a long journey to, you know, pursue medicine, whether it's PA, whether it's occupational therapy, whether it's physician, it's just, it's a long road. I mean, everything that we do, it takes time. So never give up on a dream because it takes time to accomplish it. And then this is me. Thanks everyone for attending. And now we'll just do questions. I am on Instagram at Dr. Ellen Wood. I'm on TikTok, as you can see, I've become a you know TikTok person. Um, I'm on Facebook at Dr. Ellen Wood. That is my email and my office number. Um, if anybody want, needs to contact me for questions, um, but now we can turn it back to the um, host of the meeting and I'll be happy to answer any questions that came in in the chat. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood, for your amazing presentation. I learned so much about um, all the things that you do and all the procedures you were talking about. Um, I'll just go ahead and have you just keep that on the screen in case our students want to write your contact info down and your um, social media just to keep in touch with you. But I'll go ahead with the Q&A session. Um, so the first question we had um, from Jamili was how often and what percentage of the time is endometrius the factor that causes infection? infertility? Well, interestingly, we used to, we used to have to diagnose um, everybody with endometriosis. So part of the basic fertility evaluation used to be, we would try treatments with fertility pills and then we would do inseminations. And if that didn't work, everybody went to surgery. Everybody went to surgery. Okay. And we diagnosed them with endometriosis or not. Cause a lot of times patients would get pregnant after surgery. The problem is um, one um, study came out that you need to do 12 surgeries to help one person get pregnant. And the other study came out you need to do six surgeries to help one person get pregnant. So about 2010, they realized that surgery is not the most efficient way to help patients get pregnant in vitro is. So I would have to say of my patients, maybe 20% right now are diagnosed endometriosis. However, of the 15% of patients with unexplained infertility, probably more than half of them have endometriosis. They just have not been diagnosed. So some of those come, they are, they pain, they've had surgery before they come, oh, I had surgery a couple of years ago for endometriosis. So they come to me and they have the diagnosis. But we, at this point, rarely make the diagnosis ourselves, whereas 10 years ago we did, um, because in vitro, all roads lead to in vitro. So what we feel happens with endometriosis is that if it's not distorting your anatomy, like messing up your tubes and stuff, it's preventing the sperm and the egg from connecting. There's just hostility inside a woman's abdomen in her pelvis that is not allowing the sperm and the egg to connect. And so because of that, when we take out the eggs and we fertilize them in the lab with the sperm, they get pregnant. And so we didn't really care whether they had endometriosis or not because our whole goal is pregnancy. Now, infertility is one of the main symptoms of a patient with endometriosis. And it was funny, I'm the only doctor, I took my general OBGYN boards and when they give it this question on endometriosis is an oral board. And the doctors, two doctors sitting in front of me, you know, asked me the questions like, all right, Dr. Wood, can you please, you know, tell us about endometriosis? What are some of the major symptoms of endometriosis? Well, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is infertility. So I'm like infertility, pelvic pain, they're like, and literally at the end of the exam, they're like, that was a very interesting answer that you had, you know, for that in infertility. And I said, well, I'm a fertility specialist. So one of the symptoms of endo is infertility. Not everybody with endo has to have pain. However, the most common presentation of endometriosis is, is menstrual pain. Um, so a lot of my patients do have it. Um, however, percentage wise, um, many, many, many go undiagnosed and we just get them pregnant. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that response. Um, another question we had was in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that some couples are unable to have intercourse, but they still want a child. So what makes these couples unable to have intercourse? Vaginal spasm, um, mental issues, just sexual dysfunction. There's things called vulvodynia, which causes painful, painful intercourse at the vagina. I mean, literally I had one Indian couple that came, came to me, how long have you been trying to get pregnant? Four years. Okay. All right. Great. So you're asking about this. You have oh yeah. yeah. Okay. You go into examiner. I, I literally could not touch her. She would not let me touch her. I put her, I gave her Valium. She still wouldn't let me touch her. I put her under anesthesia in our office. She still wouldn't let me touch her. I had to actually put her under general to actually do an examination. And when I put her under general to examine her, I realized that my pinky did not even fit into her vagina. Okay. She had like an imperfect hymen, although she was allowed, she was able to have periods. Um, her vaginal opening was just not able to have intercourse. And then we have some patients that just, it, it's, it's very painful for them to have intercourse. Um, there's other, there's other patients who the gentleman has ejaculatory dysfunction and, you know, his sperm go backwards and not able to ejaculate sperm into the vagina. Um, some guys can't get an erection and, you know, we have to um, surgically remove the sperm. So there's lots of different reasons, but, but we literally, and again, I'm not a sexual therapist. So you come to me, I'm to me, I'm going to make you have a baby. So patients will come. They're like, look, we're married. We're not able to have intercourse. We're over it. We just want a kid. And so I'm like, okay. And, you know, we're able to do different things. The woman for her to be able to 
do use a vaginal ultrasound. So sometimes we'll put lidocaine jelly on the vaginal ultrasound. We'll kind of numb up the vagina before we, before we examine her, before we do an examination on her. But, you know, they're just there to have a baby. Um, you know, I'll refer them to a sexual therapist just to try and work on, you know, their sexual dysfunction. But, but um, when patients come to me, someone will just come to just one insemination. They're like, look, can you just put the sperm inside? Okay. I mean, then that's, that's what we do. So it's, it's not common, but um, I do see a couple couples, you know, who, who have these issues, you know, every year um, and we help them. I had one way, one Indian girl who she was, she literally had to watch funny videos while we were doing her examinations and her, and her inseminations, like to distract her because she just, it, it was just, she just couldn't, couldn't tolerate being touched. It was, it was interesting. And, and some of them have had, you know, some of them have had um, uh, rape or, or you know, sexual trauma, um, and that causes um, them to have issues. But others, they don't admit to me that they've had any trauma. They just said, nope, but this is just not something that I'm comfortable with. Thank you for sharing that. That's so, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So that was interesting yeah. to learn. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a time. Um, ben, you, and, and as a doctor, you have to be extremely patient, um, you know, with these patients because, you know, you, you know that they're also, they're, they've got a lot more going on than, yeah than, than you, you can see on the surface. Great. So another question we had from Jose was, how do pap smears result in cervical stenosis? I, I guess like he said, malfunctions during pap smears. In your, in your regular pap smears, so say you have a precancerous lesion on your cervix, okay? And it doesn't go away after say two years and you, you have, you're positive for a high risk HPV and you're at high risk to get cervical cancer. Your doctor is then going to meant, re, your, recommend that either they cut the abnormal tissue off of your cervix or they freeze the abnormal tissue on your cervix. So if the abnormality on the pap smear is precancer and it doesn't regress naturally, then your doctor is going to recommend that they freeze the abnormal cells to prevent long-term risk of cancer of the cervix. So it's not the abnormal pap smear that causes it, it's the treatment for the abnormal cells that causes cervical stenosis. Thank you. Um, a question from Victoria is, is there research to show how birth controls like pills and IUDs affect female fertility in the long term? Okay, in the long term, birth control pills are amazing for gynecological health, okay? So birth control pills, prevent long-term risk of ovarian cancer. They prevent long-term risk of endometrial cancer, okay? These are two huge cancers in the GYN world. Birth control pills lower your risk for both. Birth control pills do not affect your fertility at all, okay? Because the premise for eggs is use them or lose them, okay? So if you take birth control pills, you don't ovulate, okay? You're not saving up your eggs, but your birth control pills are not killing your eggs either. You had 100 eggs step up to the plate that month, and whether you ovulate or you didn't ovulate, they die off. 100 eggs step up to the plate the next month. If you ovulate or you don't ovulate, they die off. So birth control pills just prevent pregnancy. They do not alter your fertility at all, but they do decrease your risk significantly for gynecological cancer. And birth control pills do not increase your risk for breast cancer. Great. Thank you for that information. Um, another question we had regarding in the same sphere of female health is why does injury to the appendix, you mentioned this, influence reproductive health in females? Oh God, have you ever seen ruptured appendix? My God. Okay. So your, your, your appendix is the little organ that hangs off your intestines. Okay. It has fecal matter in it. Okay. So if it gets infected or blocked, it gets swollen and then it bursts. So basically poop goes all over the inside of your belly, okay? So poop is bacteria, okay? Bacteria stays in the intestines because that's where it should stay. When you have bacteria introduced into your abdominal cavity, your body goes to fight it, okay? So how does your body fight infection? White blood cells, boom. So it tries to fight the bacteria that are in the rupture, in the poop that the appendix ruptured and you get yellow pussy stuff. Like it's just, you know, pus all over your abdomen. Now the body is going to heal this naturally. Okay. The body is going to reabsorb the pus. Okay. If you're put on antibiotics, if you have surgery, but still it causes an inflammatory state in the pelvis that causes just things to stick together. So pus in the abdomen is like squirting a tube of super glue in there. 
Okay. And it can just stick everything together and it is nasty, 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 nasty. That just sounds horrible. Um, but thank it you for describing Do not let your appendix rupture. I have seen the aftermath of ruptured appendixes. Wow. Okay. So another question from Sabrina. Uh, this is um, in relation to more of your experience in your profession. Um, she says, I have heard the OBGYN residency is extremely stressful and probably one of the hardest residencies in um, the medical professions. Could you describe your experience in residency in terms of cases, work hours, and relationships with your colleagues and patients? Residency is, <laughs> residency is cake now. <laughs> residency, the way, the way I worked is nobody work, nobody works like we used to work. Like we, I mean, 80 hour work weeks were normal. Okay. I mean, we was a hundred hours. I mean, I would be on call every third night, 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours. So now it's, it's, it may sound bad now, but it, it's really not. I mean, it, it, it's, but it's frustrating to me. It's like, so you have your regular hours. You have to be in at seven. Like you have to leave at five now. Like you have to leave. Like, even if you have a, a topic or a surgery that you want to see at six and seven, nope, mandatory that you leave. Like, so residencies now, again, are nowhere near what they were like 20 years ago. Um, there's, there's mandatory hours in the work week. I mean, most of the, your colleague, you know, most people know be over 50% are females now. And, and again, because of that, it, I mean, it's a, I mean, to, being a doctor is a tough life. I mean, I'm not, we're not, we're not saying any different, but it, it used to be so much different before all, before all the mandatory stuff came in. So, um, and I think residency programs, you know, are very respectful of that. Um, but I mean, I talked to a guy as, as a husband, um, he's going to be a cardi cardiology uh, fellow. He's a cardiology fellow at Mount Sinai. And he was telling me his hours and I'm like, wow, like that sounds intense. Um, but you know, we get 24 hour shifts, 36 hour shifts. And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize cardiology fellows work so hard. Um, but it's, it's not bad. And I mean, I think the OBGYN life is changing, which is what I kind of alluded to earlier, because right now, OBs in the future are going to be very different than they were 20 years ago, because they're going to start to subspecialize themselves into people that just do surgery and doctors who just do OB. And so you like OB, there's a, most hospitals, especially these ones down in Florida now, we're, we're having hospitalists. Okay. So all you do, you specialize in obstetrics. So, so you don't actually have a job in a clinic. Like you come into the office and you work, you come into the hospital, you work seven, A to seven P. You work 12 hours on, 12 hours off. You work eight to 10 shifts a month. You make a decent living. So, but you don't do surgery. You don't do clinic. You just deliver babies. So OB is changing into who's going into a hospitalist track, who's going into just a GYN surgery track, um, you know, who's doing fellowships. Um, so the OB life is, is changing um, and evolving. And so is the residency experience. So, I mean, all residencies, you know, are, are difficult because you only have a certain amount of time to learn stuff. Um, but in this day and age with so many females in OBGYN and, you know, people have been able to, you know, be hospitalists and, and so subspecialize in certain things. Um, the hours that the old OBGYNs in their 50s and 60s are working are not what the younger guys are doing now. Awesome, thank you. So a question from Ira, um, she asks, is experiencing high stress from work or family linked to infertility? Um, well, I mean, I think um, stress hormones absolutely play a role in infertility. They've definitely shown that when your body secretes too much cortisol, you have lower success rates with in vitro. So stress in any aspect of your life, whether it's your job, whether it's personal, whether it's family, yes, is going to alter the way your brain works, okay? And your body senses, if you're under too much stress, okay, it will shut down the pulses to your ovaries and your ovaries just stop ovulating. If the eggs are still there, but your ovaries can just stop ovulating. So stress absolutely plays a role. Now, I don't have a pill for stress. I, you know, when patients are going through big treatments with me, I say, hey, look, pick a month where you think you're going to be less stressed. You know, you're going to be able to relax and, and not be, not be as, you know, because the, the treatments are very intense. So I think that stress absolutely plays a role um, where it's, wherever it's from, whether it's from work or home. All right. Um, another question we had from Nora is, you mentioned that Adderall had an effect on that patient's sperm count. Um, oh, have wow. you seen cases of reduced... Yeah, mm -hmm. Published it. <laughs> so it was a question, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, um, that's great that you published it, but uh, she's just asking, have you seen cases of reduced fertility among those who are on antidepressants too? I have. Yeah, I have. We had a guy, um, just had a guy, he was taking, was he taking Latuda? I'm sorry, I forget what it was. He was, he was taking one medicine and they changed him. No, they changed him to Latuda. He was taking one thing for kind of a depression bipolar and his sperm were great. His sperm were perfect. Like they, this drug was not affecting him and they changed him to Latuda and his sperm tanked. It's the only change he made. So we've definitely seen anti-seizure medicines, antidepressants. No, he's on Lamictal. They changed from Lamictal to Latuda. But I've seen anti-seizure medicines, antidepressants. Um, I definitely have seen them linked with um, alterations in egg quality, okay, as well as with um, abnormal sperm count production. Wow, thank you for that. Um, Madison asks, what led you to go into osteopathic medicine and how often do you use OMT in the REI? Unfortunately, uh, I don't use OMT very much in REI. Um, a lot of GYNs can use it. I, I basically just use it on um, family members and friends. Um, <laughs> that's, that's where I use osteopathic medicine. Um, but I really think that osteopathic medicine is something that produces a well-rounded doctor. And I think a well-rounded doctor is somebody who can relate to patients. Um, I think can practice, you know, good medicine. And I think learning, you know, an extra aspect of medicine and helping patients makes us look at the patient as a whole. Um, a story that I had from um, one of my personal friends Terrible, terrible back pain. He tried all sorts of traditional things, medicine, TENS units, um, stretching. His MRI said he had a pinched nerve between L5 and S1. Um, he went to a um, pain specialist and they gave him an, an epidural block. And I, I, I mean, and, and he was, this guy was in agony for, for two months. And I'm like, you know what? I'm tiny. And fortunately, I, I think you need to just, someone has to adjust your, L, your L5-S1. Like, I think they just have to do this. I mean, I know the move. I learned it in school, but you're 6'2", and I, I can't do it on you. So literally after eight months of agony, okay, I found him an osteopath um, that does manipulation, okay? After two months of severe pain where he could not walk, was in agony. He was like taking Percocet like it was candy, okay? He walks out of the osteopath's office pain-free, pain-free, like, and it's an added tool and something that should always be thought about in all aspects of medicine, but it's looking at the patient as a whole, as opposed to you go into pain, special, you're a pain management specialist, you go into anesthesia, then you go into pain and you're, all your job is to just is like, Hey, the pains, the pains of this part of their back, give them an epidural, not thinking what's causing the pain. Maybe if we fix the cause of the pain, okay, or manipulated them and fixed the cause of the pain, we wouldn't have to inject them with an epidural. We could actually manipulate whatever is pinching and that's what this, this guy did. And then the second osteopath that he went to see taught him exercises to help prevent the hamstring muscles from pulling on the back, which caused the vertebrae to get out of alignment in the first place. So I think that the approach that osteopaths take to the human body, okay, is superior to the way MDs are trained. I mean, everybody is trained in a certain way and you, you undergo this, this four-year training and then your residency and the people you, know, that you look up to and your mentors, this, you just do what they do, okay? It's kind of like, when you learn to be a doctor, it's like, we learn time is money because that's the way we make money. We see patients. So the more patients you see, the more money you make. Okay. Lawyers. Nope. The longer you talk, the better because you bill for hours. So, you know, you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Well, you know, if I spend a half an hour with each patient, I'd see, you know, 10 patients a day and I, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have any revenue stream coming in, but lawyers, no, no, no. They, they teach you in a different way. So every different profession is, is, is kind of trained and schooled in a certain way. So I think the philosophy for osteopath is to not just look at specific organs. Most osteopaths are family doctors. So we taught to look at the whole patient, but I think even in the subspecialties, um, there is kind of an emphasis on looking at the whole patient and, and not just, you know, not just their uterus and ovaries, like you know, what's going on in their life, you know, what medications are they taking and looking at the whole picture. So I think osteopaths really stress that, whereas sometimes um, that's not a, that's not stressed with the, with the MD education. Yeah, it just reminds me of when you were talking about how you kind of do detective work. I think looking at it holistically definitely allows you to see all the little clues that can help you um, treat your patients. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so we can go ahead and do the wrap up presentation. Vina will take care of that.
Awesome. Uh, please stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. That would be great. Oh, stop share. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's have a little reflection together. Um, thank you so much for the informative presentation. I think we all learned a lot from you today. And considering this, we would like everybody in the session today to have a little reflection. So what are the things that brought you to the session today? What are your three major takeaways that you got from this presentation? And what do you want to learn more about? This writing reflection is not required, but we do encourage you to uh, write it and submit it on our website to get more recognition for your hard work and also it will enhance future opportunities for you for more applications. I also would like to re remind everybody again that pre-health shadowing is launching a research program that will allow students to collect with PIs, the principal investigators, and conduct research in the fields, um, different fields and locations. And the program is 100% remote. So you can basically join from anywhere you would like. For more information, you can fill out the interest form that I send in the chat or, and then we can get back to you as soon as possible. Also in the month of uh, July, we're having a bingo board um, only for this month until the 31st. So you can have, you can basically scan this barcode and you can have your friends fill it out for a chance uh, to help the next generation of healthcare workers. We are also having a fundraiser with Krispy Kreme um, that the donation of $10 you'll be able to receive a dozen of delicious Krispy Kreme donuts. And then lastly, it is the perfect time to exercise outdoors with pre shadowing new pledge drive event. So for this event, you will essentially be able to work out and help raise money for an excellent and healthy cause. For every $5 donated, you'll be required to exercise for one hour. And then for more information, you can uh, basically see, um, see the website underneath below. And if you're interested to join our team, you can become a pre-health shadowing student volunteer or a team member. We have opportunities asynchronously or synchronously. You can come and join us here live and you can always apply. And we're always looking for more volunteers and accepting um, applications. Sorry. Now, we do ask you humbly, if you can, please donate and um, it would really help us because this is a program that we want to stay free and it's completely student, um, it's completely run by student volunteers and we are working around the clock to make this accessible to everyone and basically our site and Zoom isn't free. So if you can, we'll humbly ask you to donate and we understand if you're not in a position to donate, we will ask you to spread the word around to your friends, family and other people you know and bring awareness so maybe we can get some more donations and they can join our sessions as well. Now, lastly, for the part that we've been all waiting for, um, getting your digital certificate. Now, if you want to get that, you have to go to your to our website and to the professionals course uh, web page. And then from there, you will have a quiz that you can complete in 30 minutes. And then you will have two tries just to make sure you don't um, get any technical issues or anything. And at, when you pass that exam, you will be able to get your certificate. You have to pass to the 70% or higher uh, and we ask you just so that our website doesn't crash for the high load of people. You, you come like from one hour later of this session just so we can make sure the website doesn't crash. And again, if you have any problems with the quiz, you can always email our team and we will make sure that all technical issues are solved. Now, if you missed a part of our session today, you can always go to the Pre-Health Shadowing YouTube channel uh, or to the professional's web page, and you can always see the course again and take notes if you want to. 
Also make sure to catch every sessions. Uh, we post them on our website. So we have um, sessions every weekday, um, different weekdays and make sure to sign up for them if you, if you can. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for time, uh, joining today. Uh, we hope to see you next time. And if you have any questions, feel free to stick around and ask our team. With that said, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. And now you're all free. You're free to go. All righty. Well, thank you very much for inviting me.